Alrighty. So uh, to make sure that we have enough time for the session today, we're going to get things kicked off. And uh, once again, thank everybody for who's just joining now for attending the session today. My name is Kobe Sconard. I am one of the co-founders and the CEO at IdeaWake. And uh, today we're going to be talking about why you need frontline innovation, even in a crisis. And for introdu introductions of speakers, And really, actually, before we get kicked off, the thing that we really want to get across everybody today, and really the theme of this entire presentation is finding opportunity is a matter of believing it's there. And for our speakers today, our primary speaker and who we really want to focus on is Mike Rogers, who is the VP of Business Development at Amopti. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is essentially, you know, functioning as the facilitator of the session, uh, asking Mike some questions based on his experience uh, of standing up frontline innovation programs and really just going through his overall journey because it's been a very interesting one. Our agenda for today, I'm going to take the first five to ten minutes for those that might not be familiar uh, with frontline innovation and what that really means to help set the context. Uh, and then we're going to just dive into uh, Mike's innovation journey and first start with why he decided, you know, it was important to engage frontline employees in innovation and then covering learnings, best practices, and some of the common obstacles that you're going to run into when trying to get a new program stood up. Uh, finally, we like making things actionable. So we're going to end with how you can start taking action today and then end with a question answer session, uh, as well as share some resources with you uh, that will help you depending on, you know, whether you're literally just getting started and having your first conversations about uh, starting an innovation program, or if you're currently in the planning process for getting one of your first campaigns up and running. So just starting to set the context for today's session, a little bit of background on IdeaWake. So what we do is we provide a software platform that really powers frontline innovation programs. Uh, we're currently uh, powering programs in 39 countries and over 185 cities in 12 different verticals. Uh, and really what our value proposition is, is that we help employers tap into the wisdom of their workforce to capture, evaluate, and implement the 5% of ideas that will drive 90% of business impact. And just to provide, you know, a backdrop for this overall conversation and leading really into Mike's journey, because of the fact things have changed over the last six to, you know, seven months, according to a recent McKinsey study that they just came out with, 90% believe that COVID is going to fundamentally change the way that they do business over the next five years. And over 85% are concerned that COVID will have a lasting impact on what customer needs are over the next five years yet only 21% feel that they actually are prepared in order to take action on the growth opportunities uh, and the dynamic business environment that COVID is resulting in. And really even before this, right, before COVID, before all the, the really disruption from COVID happened, it was, innovation was happening, disruption was happening. No industry was safe before this disruption and no industry is going to be safe after it. So. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen some of these examples, but looking at the transportation industry who thought that they could not be disrupted, got disrupted by Uber and Lyft. Blockbuster Video had not one, not two, but three chances to buy Netflix. And then Netflix ended up disrupting them after they said no. Uh, the example that we like to give that's forward thinking is really thinking about how models like Amazon Care um, and 98.6 are going to affect the healthcare industry as a whole. So. The main piece here and what it means for your business is that companies need to continually reinvent themselves. And what we believe and what we've seen is that frontline employees offer a very diverse perspective in order to enable your business to do that. Just an example of some employee ideas that you might have heard of, many of you have used. And so some of these are examples of, you know, employees coming up with these ideas inside of their own companies and either spinning them out or companies adopting them and enabling them. And just finally, for setting the context, how some companies uh, are using that we're working with and that we're talking to in the um, you know, cross industry are using um, really the wisdom of their workforces to overcome COVID-19. And apologies for the background noise for the, uh, it's, it's very uh, active down here in Milwaukee this morning, but really brainstorming new ways to improve productivity because of the fact that workforces are now fully remote uh, to improving safety when you reopen your doors, to uh, a lot of consultancies are having to completely reinvent their product offerings based upon the fact that they can't go and be face-to-face -face with their clients. So these are just some of the different categories that companies are, you know, going to their employees and asking them questions about in order to, you know, drive innovation and make sure to take advantage of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic versus, you know, being disrupted by it. 
going into the common formats, uh, just once again, for those who are really new to the idea of frontline engagement or engaging employees in innovation, uh, traditionally what you've seen are three different formats. There's a couple like subsets of these, but you have hackathons and shark tanks, ideation and design thinking workshops, and then online innovation campaigns and challenges. And really what we've seen over the last six months is that because of COVID-19, everything is now digital, right? I'm sure everybody's more than used to now uh, being experts on Zoom, but really these offline options, hackathons and shark tanks and design thinking workshops that happened in a small group format uh, in a physical environment are now off the table, uh, really just leaving um, a large increase in the demand for these online innovation campaigns and challenges. Just to define what an actual innovation campaign is, it's the process of basically posting a targeted challenge statement, uh, which is simply a topic around an organizational goal, inviting employees to submit ideas around it, and allowing them to collaborate and help surface the best ideas, and then having leadership take those top ideas, evaluate them, and then select which ones that they are going to action. Now going off of that, I want to introduce the majority of what we wanna focus on today, which is going into some tactical examples uh, from you know, somebody that I've worked very closely with over the last several years um, in building out an innovation program from the very inception of it uh, all the way through to actually uh, taking ideas to actualization. So uh, Mike, are you uh, able to unmute yourself? No? There we Excellent. Go. There we go. Awesome. So, Mike, if you just want to take a moment and introduce yourself and just, you know, uh, some of your background in innovation, and then we'll dive into uh, your overall journey. Yeah, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. I uh, look forward to talking to everybody about the journey that I've gone through. Um, but so some background on myself, I've been in seven different industries and innovation seems to be a theme that runs through all of those. Um, yeah, I've been in new product development. I'm an engineer by back, background. Um, I tend to think of things in uh, systems and processes, but also uh, I've successfully built out uh, multiple different businesses throughout my career. Um, been able to do double digit growth um, and have a knack for just being able to understand what's it gonna take to take it to the next level and to actually put things in place um, versus just generating ideas. Awesome, thanks Mike. So going right off of that, just starting with like the inception, right? When, and I'm gonna move us over for a moment here, but like just starting with the why engage employees in innovation at all. So um, I know that this has been a common theme for you. If you could just start with explaining what, you know, in your perspective and from your experience, what made you come up with the idea or the, you know, what gave you the determination or drive to start engaging employees in the first place and really enable these types of programs. Now, does it keep muting you? It, it does. That's all right, oh, though. All right. You got yeah. to love yeah. Zoom for a little bit. Um, so I, I think it actually started. So I, I um, previously worked for Caterpillar a, a while back. So actually, one of the things I started to realize very quickly is within a knowledge network within a, um, a company, one of the things as you'd walk through at the Lafayette uh, engine plant is you'd actually walk through and you'd, you'd see our most valuable asset is our employees. And it didn't really resonate with you. It doesn't resonate with you that well um, when you first think about it. But after a while, you started to realize um, that my general manager literally knew everyone's name. He would ask people like, hey, what do you think you're, what's going on here? He would walk the floor. And this was over $2 billion that they were generating in a year. Um, and he valued every single person that was a part of it. And what you started to realize is he was enabling people to take action on their own. And he had probably 2,000 employees within that organization. And he knew almost every single one of them, which is crazy in my mind. Um, but I think it's one of those things where he was able to actually orchestrate and help people, enable people to take their ideas forward faster, quicker, and experiment. And actually, those people were asking for like, hey, I want to do this. And they would ask for money. And they, would, they actually uh, set aside money to do things and actually put ideas in place. So I think the 
empowering your brightest individuals to and individuals within your corporation and organizations to move things forward it, it, it's one of the things that's key to success as you go forward um i think one of the things we started to realize um within the different industries that i've been a part of is that uh one of the key things is that who better has information on what's happening directly with a customer and that's people interacting on the front lines. They see things, they know the pain points. And it's really, really interesting because a lot of that, as you kind of move up in the organization, a lot of those things get hidden because they've been, they're seen as problems or you need to just get through it or you just, you gotta work around those. Um, and they're, they're hidden to the point to where um, we basically accept that those are the things that we do. But also we put our patients, we put our consumers, we put our customers through those things, um, which in actuality, it's just a huge opportunity for you to open up the doors to be able to take care of those things and actually empower if you have 100,000, if you have 500, if you got 25 employees, just to actively engage together um, and actually come up with ideas, but actually put those in place. Uh, so kind of marrying my past with the opportunity that you see directly with interacting with uh, your customers, patients, and consumers. I think that's the big opportunity I see. That's great. And, you know, kind of going like off of your experience as well, um, looking at uh, just, just touching on basically, it's no secret during times of crisis, right? Uh, the first, one of the first things that gets cut in budgets are innovation. Uh, innovation budget. So if you could just touch on like from what you've seen in the industry over the last, you know, several years, why it's most so critical now more than ever to engage employees in innovation. So I'm pretty sure everyone on this webinar, or whoever will hear this is probably feeling the pressure of being isolated to some degree. Um, like it's like, hey, we want to go out, but then we read in the news that we shouldn't. Um, we want to go back to the office. We need that human interaction or that interaction to happen on a more frequent basis. And right now, it's almost like you're finding time to work throughout the day uh, versus a coordinated effort to make it happen. Um, and I, I think right now is even more important from an innovation perspective is in, I, I can't even imagine the amount of new problems that are being generated for consumers, patients, and customers right now, just because people are all remote. Like you can't have that same interaction. You can't have, even though you can look at each other on Zoom and you can kind of tell what you're thinking, you don't really get to see the whole picture and what's really happening in people's lives. And I, I think that um, cross section where you, that we're missing right now is that. Um, so not as is, um, frontline innovation really, really important, um, not only for the essential workers, but from some of the people that are interacting with customers and problems remotely, so the virtual teams. Um, I think it's really, really important right now um, from the standpoint of keeping your organization together, but also imagine you're leaving potentially 10,000 people, 500 people on the table, not being able to solve the problem that one, you're letting one person solve that problem versus a lot. Definitely. Music to my, that's just, yes, nothing to add to that. Thank you, Mike, for sharing. So kind of going from, right, where you started and, and just the background of why it's important to engage employees in innovation from your perspective, uh, the next piece here, and we will figure out how to make this actually not completely block presentation, but um, really breaking down, like if we looked at, this is higher level, but once again, you know, a lot of the folks that are going to be engaging with this content are just getting started on the innovation journey. So uh, breaking down, you know, the steps in the process from a really high level, looking at initial leadership buy-in, uh, then once you have that buy-in, planning, promoting, launching, and actually running a challenge. And then, you know, where the rubber meets the road, to your point of actually making things happen, what the best process is for selecting, testing, and actioning ideas. So we're gonna kind of break down questions into each of those three areas distinctly uh, so that we can better provide insight to folks. Absolutely. So starting from the top and you know, once you decided, hey, this is something important, I'm bought into engaging employees in innovation. Uh, once you took that first step, what was the actual like, you know, 
first first thing that you did to put that into action at the organiz at organizations that you've worked at? Yeah, so I, I think there was organizations I walked in that um, had this, and then there's organizations that didn't. Um, I think one of the biggest things you need to think through is the pace of change of technology and what's happening in every single subsector uh, in every industry is, is changing rapidly from AI to IOT to startups disrupting your space, um, people being able to go digital. Just look at what telehealth did for the health industry. Look at people buying groceries remotely now. I mean, people don't want to um, uh, consume your products and services or your goods the same way that they did in the, in the past. And that's gonna continue to change and rapidly. So I, I think one of the biggest things is you need to have eyes and ears on the ground at all times. And you need to change your organization as quickly as possible. Um, there's an old saying, there's big co and small co. Small co is a startup, a big co is like a billion dollar company or even a 10 million or 50 million, whatever it ends up being. And it's interesting. Uh, the way to look at that is the big co um, has a really hard time to move fast unless the burning platform is literally eating at their bottom line, right? And then unfortunately where they go is they cut programs, they cut employees. Instead of trying to solve problems a new different way to get to market faster, um, they, they go that way usually, unfortunately. So in today's environment specifically, small codes can move fast. They can make rapid adjustments. They can offer solutions, problems differently. Um, and it's really interesting to think through, like when you marry those two together, they don't mesh well sometimes. And what I mean by that is bringing a startup and working with a startup as a large company. Um, one of the things that you start to see is that people are resilient or um, resistance to the change within the organization. And I'm using this as an example of where a new innovative solution or pro, uh, comes in or an idea that somebody comes up with wants to try something within an organization. In this specific example, you haven't built a culture of trying things out. You haven't built an, uh, a, what I would call an innovative culture. Now, when we were looking at this, we were looking at it from a three-pronged perspective. And obtaining the leadership and organization and buy-in was based off of this. We wanted to change the culture, and that's cliche to some degree, right? But let's talk about that for a second. It's really rapid adoption and people trying things that they never did before. It's the cultural change that you need to have to take some risk and move things, things forward and see what works and doesn't, pivot quickly and put them in place. Because your organization depends on that. You won't be around, just like all those examples that you had a second ago. The second part of it is we actually wanted to diversify what offerings we're offering to our consumers and customers and patients. And if you really think about it, from a standpoint of those front lines, they're seeing stuff that people would pay lots and lots of money to be able to see the common problems and the reoccurring themes and potential solutions that could solve those consumers' uh, problems. So that is huge. The last thing is from a longitudinal perspective is the use of technology, the use of trying, the rapid adoption, that is key. So the big ones was really just the culture to be able to willing to try things. The second was to be able to look for new opportunities and solutions for uh, consumers' um, problems. Um, but the last one was the rapid adoption, like the methodology of actually rapidly going through and trying things and just saying, saying, hey, this is going to work or this isn't. Um, that was key to us as we went forward. Definitely. And the, the leadership and the organization definitely bought into that. And so like when, when you were going through that process, Mike, right, and coming up with that methodology, what were, you know, when you first brought this up to leadership, what were some of the important questions that you think could be, you know, a common thread across different industries uh, and groups here uh, for the most like important questions that you're going to be asked uh, by your leadership team in order to a, you know, start your program or for some folks on the call, uh, you know, keep your program going uh, during COVID. Yeah, I, I think, well, A, with everything that's going on, everything's reevaluated. That's, that's reality. Um, I think you need to 
think through um, some of the questions and answers to those. And a couple of those are, um, what value is this bringing to the organization right now? Um, is this something we need to do now versus later? Um, I get it, but, you know, everybody talks about culture, everybody talks about new ideas, but you know, that's, that's hard to do. Um, so you're in an area in a space that's really cool um, and it, it's not easy. You have to have some resilience, um, but it, it's also a lot of the leadership, they do have a strategy plan. They do have, what are they going to be three to five years from now? Now they're, they're probably reevaluating that at this point to some degree, um, but it's actually more important now to have frontline engagement hit, to be hitting on all cylinders in these times. So a couple of questions, the answer to those uh, couple of questions is, if you don't have a rapid ad adoption of new technologies and processes and being able to understand that methodology that I mentioned earlier, you're not gonna be able to work with companies or have ideas that are new. You're not gonna be able to move and pivot quickly enough to stay relevant five years from now. So that's huge and that's important. The second is the amount of benefit you get out of this versus the amount of money you put in, it, it's off the scale, it's different. I mean, it's the benefit you get from it is we, uh, in previous organizations, I've had over 2000 people engage in ideas. I've had uh, two companies actually get up and off the ground. These were external companies, new offerings that we could actually offer people. Um, that's huge. That's stuff that never actually existed before. We're solving problems and moving in new directions. The last one to kind of go back to my three questions is the culture component of it is, is we're actually making decisions at a leadership level different than we had before. I mean, we're already in a risk situation. It's not going to get any more riskier. So why not engage your employees at this point to actually help augment some of that and bring information in on what they learn from customers, augment the risk taking by doing it in a methodical way, such as idea management. And uh, I know we'll get into this in a little bit, the idea box and actually building out some of these products and services that get that information back to the C-suite. Let them learn on what's really going on versus it being bifurcated by multiple different levels of information. That's great. Um, Awesome. We kind of really hit on the last subject as you were going through those questions. So what we're going to do now and move us down here is touching on uh, just once you actually get that approval from leadership, right, for the buy-in that you need, uh, what are the tactical steps um, and, you know, some of the obstacles around the planning, promotion, and launching of a challenge? So, you know, from the top, right, leadership says, okay, we want to do this. Uh, let's make it happen. So once you get that initial approval, what are the first steps in terms of engaging departments or other stakeholders in the organization? Well, it all comes down to somewhat influence and champions, right? It's typical change management. Um, so for instance, we rolled this out to a hospital um, that I was a part of before. We had the leadership team that was basically engaged in this. They actually were helping to select the challenges. They actually, we uh, drafted helped draft a memos that they could send out for people. We did active PR on what we were doing two to three weeks ahead of time to get people used to what they're about to go through. It's almost like you, you tell them once what's going to happen, you show them once what's going to happen, and then you allow once for them to do it, and, and you continue rinse and repeat. And, and I think one of the biggest things, like literally we, did, we kicked off one of our challenges during uh, Valentine's Day. And we went around and handed out Valentine's with a card to say, here's where you sign up. Here's how you do it. It's a little quirky, but it was fun too. And a lot of people had a lot of fun. Again, you have to gauge your culture on what works and what doesn't. Um, but I don't suggest doing the typical just one method to get to everybody. Um, emails are great. Half people don't read them. You know, websites are great. Half the people don't read them. Newsletters, again, another um, proxy to get to people but actively having cha champions identified in each area that's actually talking to their coworkers about what's gonna happen. Um, part of it is if you've tried this stuff, if you have the idea box in the past, uh, suggestion box that doesn't go anywhere, unfortunately, what you're gonna have to do is build out some trust within the organization. So you're gonna have to kind of, if you think it, I'm giving you two to three weeks to promote, you might wanna back it off and do three to four 
but you might have want to have leadership that they're also rounding. I can imagine if you're in a facility, a manufacturing facility, actually going out and talking to the group huddles, huddle meetings, stuff like that. Um, but I, I think really empowering. Uh, you have to coach um, some of the uh, champions to say, hey, you have to get their buy-in too with us. Um, but having those champions there, but also you have to coach up to the leadership team too. It'll be new for them. So you have to kind of walk them through what it is and, and how you get them actively engaged. Yeah. And, and Mike, going off of the, um, you know, the champions diving into like really defining that a little bit more, because I think this was something that was done really well um, from, from your perspective, talking about not just the champions from like the leadership level, but uh, could you just explain a little bit more on, you know, the engagement of the frontline champions and that champion network that uh, was built out? Yeah, so what we did was we were very, a um, within the hospital we were at, um, we knew um, quite a few of the, the individuals that were on the leadership team and someone that had built out a good influence network uh, within that hospital. They knew who to go talk to and who would be the most influential. If not, we asked around, tried to get who's been there potentially even the longest or who basically has had the most input or most influence within the area. So for instance, we would go into a hospital floor. Uh, we knew the RN at that point or the registered nurse that basically was probably the most influential. We'd sit down with them, their leaders, say, hey, we'd really like to try this. Would you be willing to do that? Those people rose to the challenge and really helped us to promote it and made it fun. But we also gave them the opportunity to say, hey, what would you do? How would you do this? actually getting the buy-in from them as you went through that process. Um, and then what's the best way to reach people? Um, and some of it was like texting. I mean, I, it literally came down to everybody at this point has most people's cell phone numbers. And it was like, hey, can you tell second shift about what's going on? And hey, can you tell third shift what's going on? And they, they kind of kept each other accountable for it, but also they had a lot of fun doing it because, and especially when we took their ideas and turned them into companies, that was just like the snowball effect. It literally, like everybody was engaged. They're asking when to do the next one. Um, they had ideas that they wanted to get off the ground. Um, and that was a great, just building the momentum up. Definitely. And, you know, we've talked a lot about promotion, but uh, obviously there's several other components to, you know, the initial planning, um, promoting and actually getting uh, a challenge set up. If you had to choose, you know, I know that there's so many different components to it, but in your mind, right, from, you know, running several of these, what is the, if you had to choose one thing that was the most important component of the planning process, what would it be in your mind? I think um, if I was going to do this today, right now, and um, in any of the participants on this calls or anybody that sees us, uh, facilities um, or just virtually as you go forward, what I would do is I would start to think through the anticipated, like where's, where is, where are you going to see early adoption to this and where are you gonna see some pain points? And what I mean by that uh, effectively is like, we knew it was going to be harder in a hospital to gauge the physicians. Um, so therefore we put extra promotion and extra tactics in place to engage those. Um, and we actually went to the department chairs, like we, we went above and beyond in certain areas to make sure uh, that those people are engaged. Um, we also had leadership do that. Um, so I, I think it really, it, it makes a lot of sense to do the pre-planning stage before you launch. Like, please don't just go out there and launch uh, as fast as you can. Um, it won't turn into what you want, but also part of this is the education and building the awareness that the stuff is happening. And then people might not engage the first time, but as soon as they start to see a positive outcome, the gates open and more and more people uh, engage. So the second, the third time you do this, uh, every challenge after that, uh, you'll see higher and higher engagement rates. Great. And going into, you know, where the rubber meets the road, my, one of my favorite phrases. Uh, so going through the process, we collect all these ideas, right? And once you receive all this input and you do some of the, you know, voting and you surface some of the top ideas from the employees, uh, what do you do once you've received all the ideas? 
Uh, and instead of talking about the testing piece of it, like I, I think we should start with the right selection criteria and who to engage in the selection of the ideas. And then from there going into the actual like rapid testing of those ideas. Yeah, so I, I think you have to, this is a journey, not a destination. You're building out a new capability at the same time you're realizing gains from solutions. So you have to, you have to be pretty thoughtful. Um, so we recently engaged the leadership team um, the previous time we ran a challenge. And we really sat down and said, what are some areas of focus that we should look at? Um, not only to get the challenge going, but to think through what does that mean when you get ideas? What do you do to select? Um, which ones go forward, which ones don't? Um, so we really focused on engagement and getting people engaged. Um, a lot of people uh, recently within healthcare, we did one of these. A lot of people really focused on engaging the patients and they're really passionate about that. So we took that passion and said, okay, how do we help uh, augment that passion with an idea challenge uh, to build out new products and services for them? And that really resonated really well. So we intentionally did that. Now there's other areas that we wanted to go after at some point. It's like, how do we grow into new services? How do we get a little bit more specific around certain areas and topics? But we really just wanted to get people engaged and for them to get educated that and empowered to be able to do that. So part of the selection criteria at the end of that is, was which ones came up with stuff that resonated the best. We literally pulled out almost the business model canvas and said, here's your value prop. Here's how you're going to deliver it. And how well do you know your customer? Like, how, are we actually solving a problem? Now, a lot of people will come up with ideas, um, but they, in their minds, they, that's their problem that they're facing or they see. But have they verified that is truly the job that needs to be done or the unarticulated need of the consumer? So we really got into, do we truly understand the customer? Do we understand their pain points? And not just what they tell you. Um, but what actually they're feeling and what truly is happening and what they have to get done that they're either working around or doesn't exist at that point. Um, so really asking almost not only just the five whys, but there's a great book out there called The Mom Test. It allows you to understand really is somebody just telling you their surface problem or are you getting to the unarticulated need or some of the, uh, the unmet needs. Um, so understanding those, that was the real point uh, within the selection itself. So we got, again, coaching up to the leadership team. We talked about value prop and we talked about do they truly understand their customer and the problem. Problem solution was really, really important for us. And also, is it viable? Like, is there something we already know right now that just doesn't make sense? And then instead of saying no, go off and have them verify it. So doing testing. Um, a lot of the selection, at least initially, was we're like, okay, there's a lot of concerted effort and engagement around these three topics. We agree with those. Those are the ones we're gonna go after. Those are the fun ones we actually funded to go forward. We want them to go out and learn more about the customer, learn more about the solution, more about the problem, truly understand what that is. So really, where was the passion? Where was the engagement to start out with? Um, that's where we started, at least initially in the last one. In other cases, start around which ones might be completely out there. I wanna learn more about this. Actually, I'm gonna select that one because I don't think it can actually be viable, but I wanna learn more about it. So the selection process is about learning, but also about kind of moving, um, diverging from your current thinking as a leadership team and diverging as, as an organization on where your employees could see things that you don't. So there's multiple different ways to do it. We did it from an engagement perspective. You can do it from a div uh, diversion of thought, um, but experimentation is what happens after this. Like I wanna learn more about something, or I think, hey, wow, I really like this one. I, how come we haven't done this yet? So there's different criteria that you kind of see, but it all comes down to, do you have a true problem and a true solution? And which ones of those do we want to learn more about and go after them? Definitely. Uh, and kind of tying off, you know, to the next, to the real next piece here where, you know, you have selected some initial ideas now to go out and action. Uh, but what do you do with those ideas? And this is one of the most common things that's brought up, right, um, uh, with our customers, but also the market in general, 
when you just hear of, you know, success stories or horror stories of, you know, once you have these ideas, how do you actually drive them forward once they're selected and we want to action them? Uh, because of the fact that organizations oftentimes when they stand up these programs don't have, uh, to your point, Mike, the infrastructure set up uh, in order to go through and start, you know, testing those ideas in a rapid fashion to see if they'll work or not. Uh, they often will get stuck in a budgeting process. Um, you don't hear anything about them for six to 12 months. So, um, I mean, obviously this is, you know, near and dear to both of our hearts, but uh, kind of it's abstracting and not going straight into the idea box. Um, but what does the process look like and, and how can you engage employees in like the actual testing once things are selected? Yeah, so I think, again, going back to the big three things I talked about, uh, changing culture and really getting that uh, uh, pivot, test, learn um, built back into the organization to where we rapidly test things. Um, but then also understanding that we can um, get, we're going to probably have to take quite a few shots on goal to be able to come up with new products or services for our customers. And that's, by the way, totally normal in any kind of R&D or new product build. Um, what better uh, way to you to have um, your army of one in the individual that's on here trying to run an idea program into an army of 50 and to an army of 60, and especially when you have four or five individuals on each team um, and then empowering them to actually go off and test things, get quick uh, results, get a few insights, quickly understand, hey, we want to go that direction, are we not? Or, yeah, I just want to find out a little bit more. Let's keep going. Those are the types of things I think you have to really think through. Some of the obstacles you start to see within organizations is um, people don't frame it up as we can move faster together um, in the long term versus quicker alone. And, and I, I, they'll probably want to pick like one idea and they're like, okay, that's great. We have that idea. Now somebody else go off and put that in place. The original person that actually came up with the idea, what better way to empower them to generate more ideas, but also generate all, all over the, the culture components and the rapid testing component of it is empower them to be able to do it. And part of the idea box, I think, is rapidly testing and, and building out solutions um, over a very short period of time and being very conscientious of money, too. Like this isn't a large amount of money that it takes to actually um, go off and test these things and learn and bring that back to light. Uh, we presented to the C-suite some of the findings that we've had. And one of the things that one person said to me was, and it was the leader of the hospital, he's like, this is the most rewarding thing I've ever done as a hospital administrator up until this point. And he has been over that hospital for 23 years. And he said, the reason why was because now I have thousands of people trying to move us into the right direction, be willing to take a little bit of risk and be able to augment where our patients want us to go, not me making the decisions for everything that has to happen. So just something to think through as you take it forward and, and overcome some of those obstacles. Mm -hmm. and, and overall, like to go off what you're saying, Mike, it's, it's really involving and building that culture of innovation and that you know culture of risk taking, even though there's small risks is involving the employees themselves beyond the submission process uh, and like the actual ideation process, but really enabling them with the time and the tools and the process to go out and take their high level concepts and validate whether it's going to work in the market or not. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, there's a ripple effect. They'll say, they'll come to you with another idea and it wasn't just a challenge. It's, it's the second, third, fourth magnitude of the person that didn't engage, that had a great idea, that now saw somebody's uh, ideas actually being put in place and built out and actually comes to life, that person's now gonna engage and bring their ideas forward. And that could be the one that actually propels and makes hundreds of thousands of dollars for you or millions of dollars or solves a major problem that your consumer has that you're trying to figure out. Definitely. All great stuff. So, Kind of going into the last section that we have here before we open it up for Q&A is just talking about putting advice into action. So um, knowing what you know now, what's one piece of advice you wish you had like before actually starting the process of, you know, running these frontline challenges? 
I, I think you never truly appreciate the amount of work that it takes to promote. And I wouldn't say work as in like, you're gonna spend long, long hours. I think it's the thought process of thinking through how do we engage the most people possible, but also how does it promote, how do you get this uh, promoted to get some of the most unique ideas that you see? And then what are some of the things that um, you can provide people to uh, encourage them to come to the table to contribute ideas. So um, for instance, having some insights or having some ideas on where the industry is going at a high level allows them confidence to put their idea in context to be able to put that forward. So a lot of things I would do going forward would be, I would provide some tidbits about uh, information about uh, maybe their problem, what's going on in the world, a, a little bit about it, stuff like that, to kind of, kind of um, uh, put some fuel on the fire of idea generation. So that's one of the biggest things. The other thing is I would put a, a consorted effort to think through a little bit more, not only the champions, but which groups could we engage that potentially haven't been engaged before or people don't want to engage because they're resilient to change. Those are the people that are holding on to things that they've worked through. Um, that, those are the individuals I'd want to engage more even. Great, and all, that's, all, that's all great advice um, from what we've seen as well. But uh, to just help put this more into action, any, any advice uh, on first steps uh, or tips that you just have in general from what you've learned uh, that participants can take after the session to just, you know, get started or take the next step on, you know, getting one of these programs up and running. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things to think through is, um, A, understand that a lot of your effort is going to be on the coordination and engaging of people. Um, I think leave it to companies like IdeaWake um, to help augment your capabilities to do the outreach, um, to help with marketing, to help with the software, uh, to be able to generate the ideas. The engagement will happen without you act. You can multiply yourself uh, through the software, through the idea program to actually put these things in place. Um, and that that's massive, by the way. If you have 10,000 employees, you can engage all 10,000. Uh, you can do that as one person. So one of the biggest things I would say is definitely look into you guys' uh, software program and the idea box and everything else that you offer. That should supplement your uh, thought process on how to get this started and how to engage people. But also one of the biggest things is, you know, start with the leadership team. Make sure you got an engagement from them. Start with an early win. Um, and, you know, if you have to go down the engagement journey first, like we did, uh, or if you want have to solve a problem that's really specific to either a product or a market somebody wants to go into, you know, just give that a lot of thought as you go forward. Um, and I think you, Kobe, and your team are there to help with the marketing and being able to pull that off. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and, you know, really great advice. Mike has been through this, you know, this process several times uh, and has really learned a lot. I've learned a lot from him as well uh, going through this journey. So uh, what we want to do now is, is open it up for any questions that folks might have. Uh, and then from there, we will, you know, close out the session. So if you don't know how to raise your hand um, or ask, ask a question, in the uh, in Zoom, there's a little section. If you hover over your um, uh, like the bottom panel called Q and A, if you just want to click on that, uh, you can go through and actually type out a question, and then we'll receive it. So we'll see if anybody can you know get that piece figured out, uh, or you can try raising your hand as well. And uh, while we're getting some of those questions in, if there are any. Mike, do you want to just give any closing remarks on, you know, um, for folks or any other tidbits of information? Yeah, I would think that a couple of things, um, and I'll break it up into two, is this is extremely rewarding. Um, and one of the biggest things to think through is when you have an empowered employee building something out, they've tested it, they've validated it with a consumer, they're bringing a solution to light. Uh, they're empowered. They take that back to uh, their um, their peers. 
wow, that's that's powerful for your organization. Um, and that that's something that, um, you know, you might not see it at the light at the end of the tunnel when you're first getting started, but about halfway through, you start to realize, wow, we, we need to do this and we need to do it more often. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece is understand this is a journey, not a destination. It does take some time to build out a capability. So you might have to engage people to start out with, um, but then you can get into some really cool stuff. If the leadership team wants to expand, and I'm just making this up, uh, a product line into a new area, uh, you can do that. Um, and you can actually put that challenge out, but you might have to get them engaged um, and, or get the employees engaged in solving some of those problems. But it almost becomes, again, that snowball effect. It, you perpetually start to see more and more ideas coming forward. Um, but don't forget that sometimes you have to inject some new insights into the teams. Um, if you do uh, a couple challenges with the same potentially 30, 40 people, um, it becomes a, per a perpetual thing where you're giving them new insights. They're learning new things. You're going to market differently, new solutions, uh, potentially even new cost savings uh, are associated with us. Um, but there's some really cool stuff that happens once you get started and you start going. Make sure you talk to the leadership team about that and it's a, de a destination. It might take two challenges, but here's the things you're going to learn. And here's where we'll be uh, in this stage, that stage, then the stage after that. Awesome. And um, I do have a couple questions in here. So one of the questions was um, how ready your program and organization were to deliver rapid adoption? Um, and then did you work directly with IT? Or did the innovation team have those skills and capabilities around IT? Um, and I think talk, talking about the, you know, in the early days, Mike, versus as the program become more developed, touching on that, basically, like, how do you, how do you work with adoption when you run into barriers um, around things like IT? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things you have to think through, so depending on your organization, some organizations have the capabilities to do, if you're building a SaaS solution, have programming or not, um, or have the capabilities internally to turn your solutions or ideas that you're coming into solutions, right? So kind of that make versus partner with somebody to build it out for you, that decision has to really be made. Um, so we, um, in my, um, within the hospital that I was talking about a second ago, we actually outsourced the uh, SaaS solution or the apps itself. Um, but what we did was we did a minimal viable product. We did a lot of wire mockups. Again, you don't have to do a lot. And the idea box uh, walks you through this. You don't have to do a lot to verify you have a customer that wants it and it's solving their pain points. And you know if the business model is relevant or not, um, but also is it going to help your organization? Um, I think uh, one of the biggest things that you look at um, is at that point, then you can go out external and say it's worth investing this much money to build it out even further. But if you find a dev shop or a mock-up shop, or if you have the capabilities inside, you have that really depends on the organization, but those are the two things. Uh, now, getting the idea management software up and going with your organization, obviously, Kobe, you guys got that handled. Um, that's pretty turnkey at this point. Um, but from an, a rapid adoption on the front line to be able to augment that, I, I, if you don't have the capabilities internally, I would look outside. Um, but again, think of it, that's why the idea program uh, and the idea box is really important because it walks you through um, how much money to some degree you're going to spend or with the lingo that you go to a dev shop and talk. And what I mean by that is the dev shop's going to come to you and say, hey, we can build an app out for a million dollars. That's a no-go right away, right? But you don't need an app. You just need a wire mock-up. And then what about that do you actually need? I just need four screenshots to go out and talk to people. I need to get their feedback on where it is. So it, it's kind of the waterfall effect, and it walks you through that methodology to be able to do that. But it I'd be an under, understanding of what you specifically need at what time. If you got the IT resources inside, I would still follow the same methodology. Don't go off and build a million dollar app if you don't know if it solves a um, customer problem. 100%. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. If not, uh, follow up with another one, please. Of course. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, one of, got a couple others in here. So um, 
examples of measuring uh, changes in progress. It's essentially how, going through measurement um, of innovation culture in an organization, uh, and especially in the virtual COVID landscape. So I'm gonna add just one initial tidbit in here. Um, uh, and then Mike, please just feel free to add into it as well. It's when you're looking at the defining and measurement piece of it, uh, the first, a lot of that comes down to you're trying to get to employee engagement type metrics. Uh, but another way that you can measure it is the amount of time that it's going to take you to get a new concept from a concept stage to an actual, you know, pilot phase. So that's one area. But then also, if you're looking at, um, you know, a lot of the organizations we work with are doing annual surveys. One of the ways that you can, you know, track a change in engagement is by basically organizing that survey uh, around um, basically a baseline, do it uh, one year and then you have a baseline set. Uh, and then from there, six months later or 12 months later, you can do another round of surveying and actually see the change and the delta in that engagement rate. Quantifying the dollar value of certain things is um, like engagement might be difficult. Uh, if you're using something like McKinsey's Organizational Health Index, though, they actually do provide tools to quantify dollar value out of it. Um, so, Mike, feel free to add on to that as well. Yeah, I, I, to add to what you just said, I, I think very specifically for us within the organization was, I mean, engagement. I mean, how many people are engaging it per week? We shared that with the leadership team. Like, look how many comments we got. Look how many people, how many ideas we're getting on the idea on the idea of management software side once we jumped into the idea box um the second half of the program we literally had people presenting to c-suite people i mean what better way to measure from conception of like i think i have an idea to full-blown company like we're launching a company you can't measure that as in like from a kpi perspective but i can tell you at that level it's a dialogue they see it they see the power of it. So you can measure that the funnel is gonna be full from an idea perspective and engagement perspective up front, but then the end result at the end where it becomes more of a dialogue on, hey, should we invest 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 in this idea? Because we see the ROI, it's huge at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and going to making this more tactical, like it, st starting with, you know, the very front end of the process and the challenges that you're running, you want to have an understanding of what leadership's appetite is and how quickly you're going to need to show a tangible dollar return on investment. Uh, to Mike's point, this is a journey, not a destination. Um, you said that a few times in the, you know, throughout the presentation, but if there is very, you know, if you have some leaders that are hesitant to try out the program and some leaders that are very for the program, oftentimes what we'll have organizations do is run uh, a challenge that we call quick wins, small ideas with big impact. Uh, and from there, what you do is you, A, have a really broad topic that's going to collect a larger swath of ideas um, that are not going to be as targeted, but you're going to be able to get some direct dollar savings that are in the quadrant that are easy to implement and low resource to implement. So you can just show really tangible dollar value ROI up front which then opens the door to the larger dialogue of being able to do, you know, measurement of employee engagement, uh, long-term measures like, you know, implementing new products and services that often have a two to three year time horizon. Uh, Cause that's at the end of the day, what a lot of folks are thinking about uh, on the call, I'm sure is how do we, you know, justify the existence of this program and sometimes short-term it's a, just understanding what for delivering on that and meeting leadership team or the organization where it is, and then starting them down the journey and the path over time to make bigger and bigger bets. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think the other aspect of this, and we didn't even touch on it yet, is really the cost savings uh, or continuous improvement side of it. So if you want to think about it from that perspective, I think one of the biggest things, those, those could be early wins. Those could be things that you just put in place within 30, 60 days. So you have to kind of balance, I talked about a lot of the growth and building out new businesses or potentially uh, solving new, bringing new solutions to life, um, which could take a little bit longer, but also some of the, the same aspect and the same approach still uh, applies to continuous improvement. And continuous improvement could be like millions of dollars saved within one year. That justifies the program right away. Mm -hmm. You know, So you really have to gauge where your leadership team is at. Um, and part of the reasons I would say, 
if you look at this um, in a virtual perspective is just imagine the unproductivity, if that's even a word, um, with everybody basically trying to maintain um, working while they're in a, a, a different environment. Everybody's in a different situation. Um, so what are the things you can bring to light to actually increase productivity too? So uh, lots of opportunities. Definitely. And I think with that, we are almost out of time. So our time flies when you're having fun. So um, I guess in closing, just, you know, thank you everybody for joining us today. And uh, if you have any questions on, you know, um, what we've talked about today or want to, you know, continue a dialogue around uh, how you can get some of these programs set up, this is what we do every day. It's our passion. Uh, so please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Here's our contact info. Uh, definitely we'll share, um, you know, some follow-up resources with you as well. Um, and then if anybody's interested in connecting with Mike, please just let us know and, and you know, we can, you know, make that introduction. So, Mike, anything else that you want to say in closing? No, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, learn from others. Um, Idea Week has an awesome program, both on the management side and on the box side. And this, these are things your organization is going to need. Um, what better way to employ, empower your employees, especially in a virtual world? Definitely. Awesome. Well, with that, we are going to close things out. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out with questions or if you want to just continue the conversation. Thanks again.